Hello everyone, welcome to this research methods tutorial about quantitative data analysis. If you're not familiar with how to use these video tutorials, then you can just pause here and have a quick read, otherwise we're just going to carry on. There are four different types of data that psychologists could collect from their research, and you can remember these with the mnemonic NOIR. The first kind is called nominal, and the word nom can mean name in French. So here it just means counting frequencies in named categories, such as verbal or physical acts of aggression. The next kind of data is called ordinal, and as the name suggests, this indicates the order of the results. So for example, think of this like a race, where somebody comes first, someone comes second, and someone comes third. The gap between each position is unknown. Interval data is on a scale with equal intervals between each value, so something like measuring temperature in degrees Celsius. And in ratio data is similar to interval data. It's still on a scale with in equal intervals, but here we have a true zero, so something like time or length can't go into minus numbers. One way we, that we can describe data is to use descriptive statistics like measures of central tendency. And one of these is the mean, which is the arithmetic average. To calculate this, you add up all of the scores and divide them by the number of scores that you have. And you can use this with interval or ratio data. So for example, with this data set, we could add up all of these numbers, which comes to 50, and then divide it by 10, because there are 10 scores. And that would give us a mean of 5. A strength of using the mean is that it takes all of the data values into account. However, this could also be a weakness if there are extreme values in the data set. So if there were an extreme score here of 20, that would make the mean score much higher. Another measure of central tendency that you could use is the median. And this is the middle value of all of the scores when they're arranged in numerical order. And you can use this with interval or ordinal data. So for example, with this data set here, the arrow shows where the middle value would lie. So the median here would be six. This is good to use because it's not affected by extreme values. If there were an extreme value at one end, that would be cut out. But it's not suitable for small data sets. And the last measure of central tendency that you need to know is the mode. And this is the most commonly occurring value so you can use this with nominal, ordinal or interval data. So if we look at this data set here, we can see that 6 is the most frequently occurring value, so that would be the mode. Again, this is not affected by extreme values, so that's quite a strength. But it's not useful if there are many common values, so it would be difficult to decide which value to use. It might be best in that instance to use a different measure. Measures of dispersion show how spread out the scores in a data set are. And the easiest way to do that is to use the range, which is the difference between the lowest score and the highest score, plus one. Okay, this is very quick and easy to calculate, but it can be distorted by extreme values. Another measure of dispersion that you could use is standard deviation, which shows the average amount that scores deviate from the mean. To do this, you'd calculate the difference between each score and the mean, then square those values, and then find the sum of the squared values, which is called the variance. And then you'd find the square root of the variance, and this is the standard deviation. Don't panic, you won't need to calculate standard deviation in your exam. It's just helpful to know how it's calculated so that you can evaluate it better. The strength of using standard deviation is that it uses all of the available data. And there are no major weaknesses, apart from it being time-consuming to calculate. Another tool that you can use to describe data is to put it onto a graph. And there are four graphs that you need to know about for your exam. We'll start by having a look at bar graphs, which are used with nominal data. So because nominal data is in separate categories, we use separate bars on our graph. There are gaps between the bars. When you're drawing a graph, never plot individual participants' results on a bar graph. Instead, use a measure of central tendency, such as the mean, to allow easier comparison 
between the groups. If you're asked to sketch a graph, you still need to give the graph a meaningful title, include a scale, and label both of the axes. You may be asked in an exam to interpret a graph or to describe what a graph shows, and this means that you should just say what you see. So for example, we could say that this graph shows that males reported less stress than females in both timed and untimed conditions. We could also say that the highest mean rating score was for females in the timed condition and the lowest was for males in the untimed condition. All we're doing here is saying in words what we can see on the graph. You could also be asked in an exam to state a conclusion which could be made from the graph. And this means doing more than just describing it. So for example, we could conclude from this graph that males find completing mazes less stressful than females, or that time pressure can cause higher self-ratings of stress in both males and females. Another type of graph that you could use is a histogram. And these are used with continuous data, so here the bars are touching. The column width should be the same for every column. When using a histogram, put all of the possible categories along the x-axis, even if there's no data in those categories. The area of the column shows the frequency of scores in each category. On this graph, if you wanted to find out how many people scored less than 30 on the test, you could add up the frequencies of the first three categories, and you'd find that there were 10 people who scored less than 30. You could also find out how many people are represented on the graph by adding up all of the frequencies, and you'd find that there are 16 people here. A frequency polygon is useful if you want to compare two sets of results, so you can't do that on a histogram. You can also use it to identify the mode. So in this case, we're looking at the most frequent test result we can see that the mode is 8. You can use different colours to represent different sets of results. The last kind of graph that you need to know about is a scatter graph, and these are used to visually represent a correlation. Each data point on the graph represents one participant. You can find more information about correlations on the correlation tutorial. You can add a line of best fit to your scatter graph. It doesn't need to start at zero, but it should connect as many data points as possible. The final thing that you need to know is how psychologists describe the significance of their results. So inferential statistics can be applied to quantitative data to determine the probability that the results found are due to chance and the letter P is used to represent probability. A significance level of 5% is the accepted standard in psychology, and this can be written as P is less than or equal to 0 0.05. This means that the probability of the results being due to chance factors is 5%, and the probability of them being due to the manipulation of the independent variable is 95%. You might also see a significance level of P being less than or equal to 0 0.01, and this means that there is a 1% probability of the results being due to chance, and a 99% probability of them being due to the independent variable. And that's all for this tutorial. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.